Well, welcome back, everyone. Now, where we last left off, I was talking a lot about symbols and how to use them and various different things like that. And now I'm going to go into some more detail about how to use symbols and some of the more cool things you can do about them. Now, we were last talking about symbols, so I had a library filled with various symbols that we could use that would very well in, be usable to demonstrate some of the other things that we're going to talk about. So I saved my progress since we last talked. Anyways, so let's say that you've got a nested symbol like this here. Now, if you wanted to make these things break apart and uh, fly off at different angles, you would not be able to do this because you can only move this symbol in bulk. You can't actually make it so that they move apart. Not in their current state, at least. But one thing that you are allowed to do is to right-click this symbol and use Break Apart. What this will do is it will remove the outermost layer of symbol and simply give you the two, two give you the constituent symbols of that uh, nested symbol. So that way you can have them do whatever you want. You can transfer these to different layers, or you could change what they do. You can tween them individually uh, after moving them to different layers, of course, and so forth. That's simple enough, but it can be useful if you've got a symbol that is a that you've been using that's a composite of several different smaller symbols, like say an army. And you want to make it so that the individual ones are all having different things happen to them. Say you want to make a shot of the army and they've been butchered and you... Then you can, instead of having to recreate their positions one by one, you can just plop the symbol onto the stage or carry it over from a previous frame. Right click it, select break apart, and then modify the individual constituents to better suit your liking. Now, that's not all we can do with these symbols, of course. I'm sure there's some cases where you're going to want to make a symbol change colors, or you're going to want to make it fade in and out and do things like that. There's a lot of uses for that, such as changing backgrounds or making the entire screen fade in or out. Well, one of the things, one of the ways that you can do this is to, you don't actually have to make derivative copies of symbols for every single tiny color change you want. If you, base, if you just want a complete uniform change of color, well, look down at the properties window. First, you might notice this properties window here. It changes every time you select something different, be it a shape, nothing in particular, an entire frame, or a symbol. In this case, while you're modifying the symbol, we can use the color drop-down box to change its color. Now, there's four different options, and uh, most of them are basically useless once you figure out how to use the advanced one. But let's go over them either way, since they can be quick. Now, going into brightness, that's very simple. You can just make it more bright, or you can make it more dark by adjusting the sliding scale. 100% is completely white, negative 100% is completely black. And anything in between those is varying shades of lightness or darkness, with 0% being unchanged. Next up is tint, which basically renders brightness, brightness completely, completely useless because you can simply recreate brightness effects by coloring it completely white or completely black at a certain percentage. This is the intensity of the tint, and if you want to make a specific color, you can fill in the red, green, and blue components of the tint, or you can just select it out of this box here, if it's an easy tint to get, like black. But if you improve the increase the intensity to... If you have 50% black, that is the same as having a brightness of negative 50%. See? Whoops. Re reset. But I digress. Off to alpha. In the alpha, the alpha layer is simply determining how transparent or opaque it is. And you can adjust this from zero, completely transparent, where'd it go? To 100% completely opaque or anywhere in between. Moving on, there's the advanced color. Now this is a this is a little bit tricky to explain, but it is also very powerful. If you click settings here, then you get this box that will show you uh, four different percentages and four different values. The values can go from 255 to negative 255, and the percentages go from 100% to negative 100%, just like the brightness scale. These determine how much of every color component, or ch or how much of every color channel, really is present if you uh, use Photoshop and things like that. But they work differently because this simply adds certain amounts of that color to it. So as you notice, the black border disappears when we bring this up to red full. 
but when we drop it down off, all the red is gone from the image, leaving us with only black. Likewise, if we add green to the image, it turns it green and yellow because it's adding full green. If we subtract the green, nothing because there's no green to remove. It's just red and black. But these percentages will multiply the amount that's present, and yeah, you can multiply it apparently by a negative number. But it does some really weird things if you got multiple colored things if you mix and match these things. Alpha has another strange effect, but the why would you have a solid value for alpha? Well, that's that's because you can have actually fills and shapes inside a symbol that will happen to have varying different gradients of alpha and different amounts of uh, different amounts of transparency. This will simply add or subtract a certain amount of that alpha layer to the image. And of course, it's probably not going to be useful if you're just doing basic stuff, but it can be handy to know. Either way, you can make whatever changes you want to the image, and the nice thing about, about changing the colors is that whenever you motion tween the object, just a second, whenever you motion tween the object between something that has one color and something that has a different color, it will tween and it will interpolate the colors you've assigned. So that means that you can easily have something fade in or out along the screen by simply changing the alpha layer on one frame to completely transparent and on the other frame to completely opaque. Simple enough, isn't it? Now, I don't have much time, so I'm going to make this quick, trying to get it done within like uh, three minutes, because that's about all the time we have left. Now, you've probably all been waiting for how to actually get this into a format that we can actually sh display it in a web browser or in or, well, Flash Player. Now, if you just go File, Save As, then that's not going to work. It's All it's going to do is save this into a format that can only be opened in Flash MX and not Flash Player, the .fla format. That's basically the source of your Flash file. What you are going to have to do is go File, Publish Settings because we're going to do something called publishing. Publishing turns it into a format that can be displayed. Now, you'll be brought up with this dialog box here, which is going to show you several different file types you can try and save it as. Right now, we're only interested in the .swf and HTML format here. So you fill in the file names here if you want to change them for some reason. You could always just rename them later, I guess. You can select the publish destination, which is basically a folder in your hard drive where it's going to save by clicking on this folder. It'll also be handy if you forget where you wound up setting that thing to, because you can click this and find where you saved your last stuff to. Now, moving on to the next tab. Here, it will determine all the settings and things like that for the Flash file that you're actually going to be producing. Now, word of warning, this happens to be set to, by default, for a very small, economical-sized vid sized Flash animation. Now, you probably don't want crappy quality, and I think a lot of this stuff's a throwback to the times when people still had, still didn't completely have all broadband. So I would recommend unchecking Compress Movie, setting the JPEG quality to 100%, and then setting these uh, things to uh, 64 kilobits per second stereo. So that means you uncheck that, set that to 64 kilobits per second, and do the same with here. Now I'm going to explain what I just did. As you probably guessed, this will determine the graphical quality of the animation in your thing, and unchecking compressed movie will make it full quality. And this will determine the quality of the audio events that are going to be showing up. So if you've got any sound in your video, then you can use these to change just how high quality or low quality they are. If you really want top quality audio, you could always bring it up as high as 160 kilobits per second. It won't let you do any higher than that. So. If you've got some really awesome music that you've included in your thing and you really, really want people to hear the, the kick music you're doing, then yeah. So moving on, just going over to here to flash into the HTML tab, you can do a bunch of different things to change things. Most of it you're probably not going to care about. If you've got action scripting in your movie, you might want to make it paused at start. So you can have a play button, you might want to disable looping, and you might want to uncheck the right-click menu. But, for the most part, you're not going to have to worry about anything on this page, or anything else on this page, which is mostly debugging stuff, or things that only matter if you're heavy into action scripting, which I haven't told you anything about yet. 
So once you're done, you click Publish. And then it generates your video. Well, that's about all the time, I, all the time I've got for this particular video, so I'll see you in the next one.